Hello everyone, I'm Peng Peng Liu from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. In this presentation, I'm glad to introduce our work, Self-Flow, Self-Supervised Learning of Optic Flow. In this work, we present a self-supervised learning approach to learning optic flow from unlabeled data. Our method distills reliable flow estimations from non-occluded pixels and uses these prediction and the truths to learn optic flow for hallucinated occlusions. Next, I will use a simple example to explain our main idea. Suppose that initially P1 is non-occluded from the first image to the, sec to, to the second image, and P1 prime is its corresponding pixel. Because that P1 is non-occluded, our NOC model can estimate it accurately using photometric loss. NOC model here means non-occluded model. Then, then we inject random noise to, the, to cover P1 prime, and P1 become occluded from the first image to the new second image. Because that P1 become occluded now, our OCC model cannot estimate accurately using photometric loss anymore. OCC model here means occluded model. Luckily, we have estimated optical flow of P1 with NOC model. Then we can detail reliable flow estimations of P1 to get the flow learning of OCC model. Note that the guidance is only implied to those newly occluded pixels, such as P1 and P2. During training, we only imply photometric loss LP to NOC model. For OCC model, apart from LP, we also imply LO to cope with occluded pixels. Then we use the pre-trained OCC model as initialization and fine tune it with ground truth optical flow. Our self-supervised pre-training removes the reliance of pre-training on synthetic datasets. Next, I will show you our quantitative results. Our unsupervised methods outperforms all existing unsupervised methods on all datasets except the central clean. Our unsupervised methods even outperform several fully supervised methods. Our fine-tuned model achieves state-of-the-art results. Note that existing state-of-the-art supervised learning methods rely on pre-training on synthetic data. This is the first time that the supervised learning methods achieve such a high performance without using any, using any external label data. Our fine-tuned model on Centaur achieves EPE equals 4.26, 4, 4. outperforming all submit methods, and until now, it is still ranked first. Next, I will show you some qualitative results. First, I want to show the effect of our self-supervision self strategy. When self-supervision is not implied, the estimate of the flow looks noisy. It is because NOC model lacks the ability to predict the optical flow for occluded pixels. After implied supervision, the results are much smooth. These are results from the KT datasets. This is a video comparison. These are results from the Centaur dataset. This is also a video comparison. Comparing with the current state of the art PWC night, our fine-tuned model estimates of the flow with more accurate data. For example, the finger here, and the leg, and the stake. To demonstrate the generalization ability of our model, we first show our optical flow estimation on real-world videos from Davis dataset. The second row shows our unsupervised results, and the third row shows our fine-tuned results. Then come, then come our conclusion. Our code is available on this website. That's all, thank you.
Welcome to my talk, taking a deeper look at the inverse composition algorithm. This work is done as an internship project in Autonomous Vision Group, MPI, and also collaborated with Georgia Tech. The seminar Lucas Canali algorithm is a widely used image registration tool in computer vision. It recovers the motion transform by minimizing the photometric residual of a warped image to the template. One classical solution to the objective is the inverse composition algorithm. In each iteration, giving the residual of a warped image to the template, it solves the incremental transformation of our region perturbed template to the warped image and it updates the warping with inverse composition iteratively. We often use a weight matrix to cope with the influence of the outliers. We also often add a damping regularization to cope with the bad initialization. Despite being popular, the inverse composition algorithm has a number of important limitations. The objective assumes phonometric consistency, which may not hold in practice. High-frequency noises or textures may fail the linearization step and makes the resulting Jacobian less informative. The way matrix is often derived from the classical robust MS meter. In this formulation, the weight of the weight of a datum depends on the point residual, which may not address the context in the high order information. Adding proper regularization is also a non-trivial task. One common way is to adjust the value damping using some heuristic rule like the trust region method. But this heuristic rule may not find an optimal solution. In this work, we will take a deeper look at the inverse composition algorithm and see how we can address these challenges using learning. First, we propose a two-view feature encoder network. It learns the feature space for the residual evaluation. The learned feature also makes the resulting Jacobian more informative. Second, we propose a convolution MS meter to learn the weight matrix using both views of features. The learned MS meter can more effectively leverage the context and the high order information to weigh the samples. Third, we propose a trust region network to more accurately and effectively approximating the trust region behaviors using learning. We use this learned damping parameter to replace the classical heuristic damping in the Levenberg marker formulation. To summarize, we make three contributions with each as a learnable module. And we follow the same computational graph as the classical inverse compositional method. We propose a two-view feature encoder to replace photometric residual, a convolutional MS meter to replace the traditional MS meter, a trust region network to learn better damping regularization. All operations are differentiable, and we train all the modules end-to-end -end using the ground truth motion transform. Like the classical inverse composition algorithm, we also perform our deeper inverse composition and cost to find. It makes the algorithm more efficient in the computation, and it also helps you learn the features with a bigger receptive field. We first evaluate our method on the 3D object motion estimation using a synthetic data set we rendered. On the unseen object with random motions, our method, highlighted in the color green, can achieve the lowest alignment error compared to baselines using either learning or long learning. We also evaluate our method on the task of visual odometry using the RGBD tomb dataset. Compared to the RGBD visual odometry baseline, which also uses a classical Lucas Canadi algorithm, our method performs significantly better in terms of various testing trajectories and also under different motion magnitude. Our method is not only accurate, but it is also very small and fast. Compared to a baseline algorithm using a convolutional network to regress the pose iteratively, our network uses orders of magnitude fewer parameters and can achieve fast inference on a commodity GPU. In this work, we have taken a deeper look at the inverse composition algorithm by reformulating with three learnable modules. Our proposed solution is learnable, accurate, small, and fast in inference. Thank you for attending my talk. Please check out poster 136 and welcome to ask questions.
Good morning, I'm Ho Wen from Microsoft Research Asia, and today we are talking about Siemens Network on wheel tracking. Recently, Siemens Network have drawn great attention in wheel tracking because of their fast speed and good accuracy. However, the backbone network used in Siemens trackers are relatively shallow, such as AlexNet, which does not fully take advantage of modern deep neural networks. So in this work, we investigate how to leverage deeper and wider convolutional networks to enhance tracking accuracy. One straightforward idea is to replace the shallow backbone with deeper networks, like VGG, Inception, and ResNet. Very surprisingly, this straightforward replacement does not bring much improvement and even cause performance drops. This phenomenon go against that increased network depth and width is beneficial for elevating model capacity. So we'd like to study the underlying reasons. One intuitive reason is that these networks are primarily designed for image classification tasks, where the precise localization of the object is not paramount. We further investigate the concrete reasons. First, we observe that if the net Siemens network contain padding, then the performance will drop significantly. For example, in VGG, it drops six points, while in Inception, it drops about five points. Let's analyze why does padding cause performance drops. Here, E is an examiner image. Why A is a search target, and B is the target with a shift. For Siemens network without padding, the learned representation of region A and B will be identical. However, if the network contain padding, the receive field will be larger. In this case, the same content region A and B will get different representations, because one sees the padding pattern while the other does not. So it causes performance drops. We call this phenomenon as the perceptual inconsistency in Siemens networks. Moreover, we found that the size of receive field and feature map also impacts the tracking performance. Also, Siemens tracker prefer a re relatively small network stride, which is more precise in optical localization. Based on the analysis, we summarize the four guidelines for Siemens network design with respect to stride, receive field, feature size, and the perceptual inconsistency. Then we design new network architectures and increase the backbone depths and widths. Our design is built upon residual units. To solve the perceptual inconsistent problem, we augment the residual unit with a cropping operation to remo remove zero patterns. Moreover, we redesign downsampling residual units to reduce the spatial and channel size of feature maps while keeping the information intact. By staking the proposal cropping inside the residual units, we build up deeper and wider networks. The construction follows our design guidelines. First, we determine the network stride. Then we stack residual units. Also, our design controls the size of the field and output features. As the table show, we provide four deeper network architecture and two wider network architectures based on the inception and ResNet structure. Then we apply the designed backbone to two representative trackers, Siemens FC and Siemens RPN. In both Siemens FC and RPN, we replace the original five layer AlexNet with our designed backbone and keep other settings the same as the original framework. We can see that on ODP datasets, the wider res inception structure get four to six point improvements, while on ODP datasets, the deep res nets achieve five to six point gains. Moreover, compared with other state-of-the-art methods, our Siemens tracker with new design backbone achieve competitive performance. Our backbone network are lightweight and guarantee the real-time speed in tracking. Here we show some visualization results to show the robustness of our tracker. Now the code of our tracker are publicly available. Welcome to our post for more questions and, que and details. Thank you. Okay, 
So we now have questions uh, for the, if you have a question for the speakers for the above three talks, please come to the microphone. So we have one microphone here and one microphone there. Um, hi, thank you. Um, very nice papers. It's great to see how the deep networks really improve things in difficult conditions. Um, for a lot of these tasks, the original classical techniques focused on using very few computations per pixel. Like the classic Lucas Canade was optimized down to basically two you know, pixel differences in a gradient. And so you could count the number of operations as maybe a half dozen floating point operations per pixel. With these networks that have millions of parameters, you know, and all three of your techniques use deep networks with m lots of convolutions and so on. What is the relative amount of computation per pixel? Is it hundreds of operations, thousands of operations per pixel? I just want to get a sense of how much slower these things are if you're counting raw computation. Can I ask is the, to which specific paper or to all of Well, all of you, because all of you are using networks. So if you basically said for my paper, yeah. how many floating point operations per pixel do I think I'm using? Um, I, I think I'll just start from mine. So mm -hmm. I think it's a great question. And I think it's really a great design choice we should be careful about when we're choosing specifically for these tracking problems or things like that. And uh, for my case, and one of the very important design choice. We want it to minimize the size of the network and want you to learn the minimal information that actually can support you to basically to, and also it may actually help you to generalize, but just kind of like to learn the minimal number of ways and so that you can do this task um, like wonderfully. So um, in, in our task, we basically choose a very small network. So you see why we have a significant drop in the number of weights. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think um, how to benchmark the actually the, like for example, the, the like the floating um, point operations and per pixel and all that stuff. I think uh, so far we haven't investigated the, the actually the, the possibly the correct benchmark to really to do this in the long term. But I think it's a good question that maybe we should be more careful about using this benchmark and to to evaluate the efficiency of the network and maybe also how you generalize in the future. Yeah. Okay. If there are any other questioners, I don't want to take the whole question period. Otherwise, I'd like to hear from the other speakers. Go ahead, Go ahead. I just didn't want to take the whole question. Can you have a uh, quick the, response? The, the quick question is, what do you think is the floating point load of your algorithms? And the, the way to measure it is not gigaflops on a GPU, but just per pixel, how many operations are you doing? Do you have any idea, or is that something you'd have to compute later? Um. I'm, I'm happy to take this question offline, so thank you very much for your talk. Okay. So let's take this question offline. Let's thank the speaker again. Uh, good morning. I'm presenting facial performance tracking. In existing approaches, a high fidelity 3D face model has been developed by encoding a highly detailed texture and 3D geometry. However, the multi-view image stream is the main requirement, which is not applicable to the mobile capture devices. So we address the following research question. Can you use a monocular video to render a high fidelity model from unconstrained domain without any labor data? So we present a new method that can adapt a high fidelity 3D face model to an unconstrained monocular video. given existing approaches with the latent representation of 3D face model. We develop a new encoder that takes a monocular image and then regress the latent representation such that it can match to the rendered scene. More specifically, our encoder is composed of two feature extraction modules that are responsible for converting a monocular image to the visual feature and landmark features. And the extractive features are combined through the skip connection such that we can consider the global and local features at the same time. And finally, these features are then regressed to the latent representation of the 3D face code and head post parameters. Now, our encoder is initially trained by lab control data set, but here is a problem. The visual differences between the lab control data and real world imagery produces a significant visual artifact such as post-tracking instability. 
Also, due to the different lighting condition, the output appearance model is not reflective of input testing scene. So we bridge this gap by introducing a new self supervision approaches based on the temporal texture consistency. For example, given an image at time t, we can synthesize unwrapped online texture using the predicted geometry. Our assumption here is that this online texture should be consistent across the time, and it is enforced by minimizing the texture, dif texture differences between the time consecutive instances. We also adapt our appearance model to the input testing scene such that we allow the render phase to be more reflective of input phase image. To do this, we further train a 3x3 three three color correction filter in an online manner by enforcing the texture consistency between the adapted appearance model and unwrapped online texture, which is synthesized from the input phase image. For this, we minimize the texture error, which is made by the pixel level, the color differences between these two textures. This slide shows the comparison of with and without self supervision, indicating that our method mitigates the domain gaps. For example, the prediction of head pose and geometry is much more robust and stable after the self supervision. Also, due to the color correction filter, the output appearance model is adapted to the input testing scene. We compare our method with three baselines, which are using the key point and vertex coordinate projection and texture regression map. And we measure the performance based on the reprojection error and temporal instability. Even without adaptation method, our method shows the better result than other baselines. And our adaptation method further enforces the stability on the facial performance tracking. And due to the nature of our high fidelity 3D face model, our method looks much more photorealistic than other baselines. And we can visualize with head pose for the facial performance tracking. And we can do the multiple rendering from a monocular video captured under the unconstrained environment. And thanks for attention, and please find us at poster session. Hi, I'm Raymond from University of Illinois, Urbana Champaign, presenting the paper Diverse Generation for Multi Agent Sports Game. This is a joint work from my collaborator, Alex, John, and Kevin. We're interested in generating and forecasting of trajectory for sports games. To model sports games, we are given a data set of game segments, such as the one shown below. The goal is to model and sample from P theater X. More formally, we denote a game segment as an unordered set of agent trajectory, X sub K, where K is the number of agent. An agent trajectory is an ordered tuple of 2D agent position, X sub KT, which is in R2. To model P theta of X, we'll need a vector representation. Consider an example with three agents, red, green, and blue. We can stack the representation of these agents into vectors in either of the following orders. Which one should we use? Let's say we pass the first vector through a deep net and get the output of green, red, blue triangle. One would naturally expect for the second vectors to get the output of red, green, blue triangle, as both vector representation is the same underlying game segment. This property is called permutation equivalence, meaning that the permutation applied at the input results in the same permutation at the output. Deep nets generally do not guarantee this permutation property. However, graph neural networks do. At a high level, a graph neural network starts with a feature vector vi for each of the nodes. It then computes a feature vector eij for each of the edge based on the nodes. Afterwards, it sends these edge feature vector as messages to the nodes to compute the final output vector, OI. The message passing operation can be characterized by its edge to node and node to edge operations as illustrated here. 
observe that the edge feature vector is computed for all edges, and the summation operator is, is invariant to the node ordering, the overall representation is permutation equivariant. Therefore, to model a generative model for multi-agent sports games, we use graph neural network to get a consistent representation. We use variational autoencoder to get a sampling capability, and we use recurrent neural network for temporal modeling. Combining these approaches in various ways, we naturally get the following ablation. An RN, a variational RN, a graph variational RN with diagonal adjacency matrix, where the agents are modeled independently and our proposed graph variational RN with a complete graph. Our proposed graph variational RN consists of a shared RN across all agents. However, each of the agents has their own independent hidden states. To model the relationship between these agents, we use graph encoders and decoders to learn the parameters of the following distributions. We use a latent variable Z for each of the agents following Gaussian distribution. Internally, our model learns the offset of the agent position by adding the pass uh, position to the decoder's output. For more details, please refer to our paper. We obtained the following results on modeling basketball games. We considered two metrics, the L2 error on forecasting the position of all agents or on forecasting the position of the ball conditioned on all other agents. We observed that paying tribute to the equivalence property lead to better performance L2 overall and modeling the relationship between the agents lead to better performance on the conditional generation task. We further analyze our approach by visualizing the player velocity and acceleration through box plot. Observe that our proposed approach more match, uh, matches the ground truth more closely. Here we show some qualitative results of the offensive players and the ball. The ball is highlighted in orange. Observe that our approach generated a realistic ball pass. However, for the baseline methods, the ball and the player simply diverge. Here we show a counterfactual experiment. We want to know what will happen if player A passed the ball to B instead of C. Therefore, we modify the uh, ground truth trajectory of the ball and observe which of the uh, prediction changes. Here, each of the column is a generated prediction from the corresponding model. Observe that the player reacts more significantly to the change in the ball trajectory for our proposed GVRN4. Uh, to learn more about our work, please come to our poster, number 139. Thank you. We present a method that jointly does tracking and detection of 2D pose of multiple people at over 30 frames a second on a single GPU. Our motivation was to build a method that is robust and invariant to input frame rate, motion blur, handling extreme camera or subject movement, and the number of people in the scene while maintaining a high accuracy. To do this, we look at some prior work. Mask RCNN and open pose were two efficient ways to extract pose using the benefits of ROI pooling or body part level extraction respectively, but had no tracking capability built in. The current top performer on the post track benchmark yields the best results, but requires extracting body pose individually from detected bounding boxes and requires solving a spatial gram temporal graph over time. Pose flow achieves competitive results as well, but requires pose detections to be done followed by tracking sequences being built after. Detect and Track propose some interesting work on regressing tubes of bonding boxes over subjects. And on the other, other spectrum, LSTM post machines demonstrated the computational benefits of recurrence, albeit for a single person, while joint flow demonstrated prediction of flow fields across key points, albeit not in real time. Now on to our method. We encode body parts as Gaussian heat maps, connections between joints as part affinity fields, and connections across people as temporal affinity fields, such as across key points, or in this case, across limbs. Our images are then fed into a feature extractor recurrently. Part affinity fields are predicted from this and the previous path. 
From that, key points are predicted in a similar manner, followed by temporal affinity fields. Jointly, we call this staff or spatio-temporal affinity field. Finally, we use this information to solve a frame-to-frame -frame spatio temporal graph across all the people detected and seen in a real-time manner. During training, we unroll the network and train it on single images followed by video sequences. With recurrence, we achieve significant computational savings with more consistent detected poses across frames, especially seen in the heat maps detected below. One can observe it for this sequence as well. For large motions shown on the left, both key point tabs and limb tabs are able to track body parts across time. But with negligible motion shown on the right, key point tabs become noisy or non-existent, forcing us to use various nearest neighbor thresholds for different scales. With limb level tabs, however, negligible motion simply means the TAF collapses into a path. Here we have an example where the nearest neighbor cost is disabled for key point tabs. As you can see, the poses in the bottom row with limb tabs are significantly more stable. To solve the spatio-temporal graph for a new frame and extract pose IDs, we use the transitivity term, where omega represents a dot product between the key points and the staff field. So here's an example. Let's say we're building a person, and we're not sure if A is connected to the wrist E or B. We can sort the temporal affinity field and select the one with the highest score, and test B to C, we know that C to D is an existing tracklet, and we know that D must connect back to A. Now we can sam sample this uh, star field. Alternatively, if we go from A to E, E to F, F to G, and G back to A, we will see that we will have a lower score. This way we know that AB is the truth, and it's connected to the ID that belongs to CD. We do experiments where we simulated low frame rate cameras, such as 6, 12, and 24 hertz. On the right, we tested the accuracy against a baseline KLT method, and we observed that the TAFs are able to outperform Lucas Canade, especially with the large motion brought about by the lower frame rate. On the left, we have a subset of the validation data set, and the results show that we were able to outperform the non-recurrent approach with better accuracy to computation ratio. Although a lower frame rate camera yields lower accuracy, Increasing the number of recurrent stages boosts the accuracy back to high frame rate levels. Our method is currently the fastest and most accurate bottom-up approach for 2D human post tracking, demonstrating the high accuracy to computation ratio. Here are some, uh, the code used to generate these sequences can be found in our project page and will eventually be merged with the open post library. Thank you for your time. Time for questions. If you have any questions, please come near to the mic, either left-hand side or right-hand side. There are uh, no questions. I believe uh, we can move to the next speaker. Let us thank our, all the three speakers once again. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Riccardo Spisaletti from the University of Bologna. In this work, we introduced G-Frames, a novel local reference frame construction for 3D mesh and point clouds. G-Frames are based on the computation of the intrinsic gradient of a scalar field defined on top of the input shape. Computing correspondences between 3D shapes is a key task both in computer vision and graphics. Effective pipelines addressing this task rely upon the definition of a compact representation of the local geometries of shapes. Such point descriptors are expected to be compact, local, and distinctive. Descriptors computed on points belonging to different shapes can be matched by the Euclidean distance in the descriptor spaces in order to build correspondences. Local reference frame methods can be divided into families, which relies on either covariance analysis or geometric attributes. Therefore, none of the previous proposal is similar to our approach.
Given a point cloud or a mesh representing a 3D shape, for each point we compute a local reference frame, which is a system of Cartesian coordinates which endows the scripture, such as, for example, shot, which we will use in our experiments with pose invariance. In these pictures, we show local reference frames computed on points on a 3D shape. As the scriptures are computed relatively on the local reference frame, their effectiveness depends on the repeatability of the underlying local reference frame. In these pictures, we show local reference frames computed on corresponding points of two shapes. Our proposed local reference frame is based on gradients of scalar function defined upon the input shape. The gradient for a given point P is computed as the average gradient of its neighboring points. We then project the computed gradient onto the plane defined by norm at point P and rescale the projection to unit norm. The final local reference frame is obtained as follows. X axis is the projected gradient, Z axis is the norm at point P, and final Y axis is the vector product between Z and X axis. The choice of scalar function determines the invariance provided by the local reference frame. In this work, we have experimented with the function listed in the slide. As for the repeatability, in this picture, we show how the chosen function is highly rep rep repeatable. Our method can effectively deal with strong differences in point sampling and with increasing surface noise. We show results dealing with rigid shape matching. In, the, in these experiments, we use the 3D Stanford scanning repository. We show in this slide the scalar function used for our experiment, mean curvature, sum of tutorial accurate distance, and flare function. We use the shot descriptor equipped with either its original local reference frame or our proposal. The repeatability of our local reference frame is evaluated using the standard metrics adopted in the literature. Our proposal with set and per function exhibits the best results. Also in the scripture matching, our proposal outperforms the original shot. As for the formable shape matching, we use the mean and Gaussian curvature like in the previous rigid setting, alongside with two additional functions designed for this specific task, the skid time evolution process and feedback vector. In this slide, we encode the heat map. With the heat map, the point was matching errors on FOSS dataset. We show that the G frames allow for more accurate skips or matching. Similar consideration applies to the top kids dataset. In this slide, we show quantitative results obtained following Princeton protocol. Again, our proposal yielded clearly the best result, in particular when using the function specifically designed for non-rigid shape matching. Thanks for your attention. For further details, come as to our poster. Welcome to my presentation titled Eliminating Exposure Bias and Metric Mismatch for Multiple Object Tracking, which is a joint work with my advisor, Pascal Foix. So let me break down the problem. Uh, traditionally, in multiple object tracking, um, the one of the most frequently used primitives is a pairwise potential, which tells us whether two detections belong to the same person or not. It could be posed as a classification or as a distance learning task, and it is typically trained on pairs or triplets of detections. It is a very natural thing allow enter a new world where we have enough data to reason on the longer time frames and we can use sequences of detections. So the question is how do exactly we use those sequences? Well, the easiest way is to do exactly the same as in pairwise case. Ask the question whether two sequences of detections belong to the same person or not. Uh, however, this comes with a number of problems now. 
First one is that during inference, should your model make a mistake, you're asking a question whether this mix of two people is the same as this mix of three people or not. This is referred to as exposure bias, when your distribution of training and inference data doesn't match. Furthermore, this question just doesn't make sense in general, which is to say that maybe classification, uh, posing it as classification task is not uh, the most reasonable idea. And if you wanted to reduce the exposure bias by training on all possible pairs of sequences, well, first of all, that would be computationally infeasible, and that would have actually a large class um, imbalance. So these are the problems that we're trying to address here, and we're trying to address them by answering two questions. What is the measure of a goodness of sequence of detections, and how can one learn to predict this measure, given that there are combinatorially many possible sequences, but would like to reduce the exposure bias. So we want our training and testing distribution to be the same. Let's start by answering the first question about what is the measure of goodness of a sequence. Ideally, we would like such a measure of goodness that reflects the target tracking metric that we care about. And so what we're trying to do uh, is to reduce the metric mismatch, which is with mismatch uh, of training and inference metric, by learning to predict the IDF metric. Traditionally, IDF is computed between a trajectory and a ground truth. Unfortunately, during inference, ground truth is usually unknown. So we actually need to predict the components of this metric that, uh, that are unknown, that is intersection of reunion with the ground truth, and predicting whether the ground truth exists at all. And we do that with a single layer uh, bidirectional LSTM, which on, uh, for every frame in a sequence predicts this intersection of reunion and whether the ground truth exists, which allows us to compute the approximation of the IDF metric, thus reducing the metric mismatch. Uh, now that we have learned this metric, uh, well, now that we have this metric, how can we actually learn it? Well, uh, we do something similar to a technique called dagger or data aggregation, where starting with the untrained model, we run multiple hypothesis tracking, um, and then we get some sequences, which we add to our training data, and we do a step of training on this data. This iterative procedure allows us to expose the model to its own mistakes, and therefore reduce the exposure bias. And the good thing about multiple hypothesis tracking in this case is that all what we need is just the comparison between two uh, sequences, which one is better, which is exactly what our model provides. So given those two components, our metric and how we train it, what are the actual results? Well, we have two versions of our model, one that uses appearance features and one that uses actually purely geometric features, that is coordinates of the bounding boxes. And with the appearance model, we achieve state-of-the-art results in, in terms of IDF metric on several data sets, but here are two most interesting findings. First one is that our metric that uses simply geometric features is able to outperform baseline methods that use appearance on the Duke MTMT C data set. And second, if you look at the top left, you can see that there is a strong negative correlation between the IDF and MOTA metrics. And we have actually made a synthetic experiment to show that these two tracking metrics are actually disagreeing in some case. So to sum everything up, here are the uh, several takeaways. First one is that if you're training a sequence model, what you might be interested in is uh, using regression instead of classification loss, and you might consider enriching your training data by iterative training inference to expose it to the errors. Second is that there is actually a large margin between how our model is trained and what could be achieved, and simple geometric features are surprisingly powerful. Third is there is a significant trade-off between MOTA and IDF tracking metrics, and if you'd like to know more, come to our poster number 142. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Junyu Gao. Now I'm gonna to introduce a visual tracking framework using graph convolutional networks. And this is a joint work with Professor Tian Zhu Zhang and Chang Sheng Xu. The goal of visual tracking is to estimate target state over time. As we know, it is very challenging for visual tracking in the real world. It is due to the occlusion, changes in illumination, scales, and fast motion. Recently, with the powerful deep network and large-scale labeled video frames for offline training, science-based trackers achieve favorable performance and efficiency. One notable example is uh, SAMFC tracker, which learns a matching function 
uh, in an embedding space and wins the VOT 2017 real-time challenge. However, most diamond-based trackers had two major issues. First, many of these trackers only use the initial target template to, to, from the first frame to match candidate patches without considering the spatial temporal information. Second, the, these trackers do not leverage the surrounding context of the target object for getting the adaptation of target appearance modeling. This is a not good choice. So, inspired by the above observations, we propose an end-to-end -end graph convolution, convolutional tracker, GCT, based on the SAMFC method, which can jointly consider both the spatial temporal information and the target context information of the current search image. SAMFC learns a similarity function f to compare an example image z to a search image x in a learned convolutional feature embedding space phi. We then design a graph convolutional transformation phi gcn into the Simon's architecture to jointly consider the spatial temporal appearance modeling, that is zt minus upper t to t minus one. Uh, and, the, and with the context information of the current search image, xt. The graph convolution is a linear transformation as the multiplication of the graph signal x with the filter w under the graph adjacency matrix A. However, learning phi gcn is not efficient since it suffers from high computational burden for modeling the message passing between current context information, xt, and each of the historical exemplar embeddings, zts. To reduce the computational cost, we further decompose GCN into two sequential graph convolution modules named spatial temporal GCN, st GCN phi1, and the context GCN, ct GCN phi2. In the offline training stage, the loss of, a, uh, of an exemplar's instance pair is generally represented as a logistic function. We use videos from ImageNet VID dataset for model training. After offline training, we use the network for testing directly without uh, fine tuning. This is our pipeline. For the historical exemplar images, we use STGCN to generate the ST features with a spatial temporal graph. Then, the generated ST feature is combined with the current context feature to produce an adaptive graph, which is used by the CTGCN to produce the adaptive feature. This feature is evaluated on the search image embedding via a cross-correlation layer for target localization. We use multi-scale patches to estimate the scale of the target. Next, we will show the experimental results. The results on four data sets, OTB, UAV, VOT 2017, shows the favorable performance of our tracker, and our tracker achieves the real-time speed. The ablation results also show all the components in our framework are useful. So for, for more details, please come to our poster. The number is one, four, three. The project page of our GCT is here. And uh, any question, please contact me. Thank you very much. OK, so we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, if you have questions for the about three speakers, please come to the microphone. Um, Okay. In the meantime, I have a question for the second. Is that the second? Uh, okay, for the second uh, speaker. So uh, it's interesting to see uh, just using geometry features, achieve, you can achieve uh, like a good results. Uh, I'm wondering what's the limitation for that. For example, uh, you can think about if you have a video in the training set and in the testing set you have video with different frame rate, then you will produce sequence with uh, very different statistics. 
so how would this time, how will you, you uh, could you comment on how do you uh, handle those kind of mismatch? So you mean if you were to train on a sequence with one frame rate and uh, right. put it on the sequence? Well, so in our work we didn't address that, but you can always uh, kind of sample it more or less to have the same frame rate. Uh, so we actually, uh, so even though on the, we, we had uh, kind of this is up to 60 FPS, we actually used uh, uh, for Duke MTMC FPS of three. Uh, so in that sense kind of, um, it, it, you can use it uh, in, in a more or less large range. So if it was not three frames per second, but four or two in some range, it would still work. But yeah, if you needed to, th that kind of statistics should probably match in training and testing approximately, otherwise it wouldn't work. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, any questions from the audience? Okay, so yep. I have a question about the graph convolutional tracking work. So basically you use utilize the same uh, network which consists of two branches. So one is a template branch and another is switch branch. So here I can observe that you have changed the template branch from initial frame to the uh, historical frame. So do you have con some consideration of appearance uh, variation which causes the creeps, the target creeps which may lead to noisy update of the template patch, template branch. So do you have such kind of, kind of uh, consideration to receive this effect? Uh, yeah, we, 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 we consider, uh, we, we major, mainly consider two types of information. The first is the spatial temporal information. This is about the historical example images. Yeah, uh, we use the spatial temporal structure of the target to learn a more robust uh, target appearance model. And uh, uh, the second uh, uh, information we used is the current search image. Yeah, it, I, I, we think this can provide us uh, an adaptive information to get the uh, target uh, appearance adaptation for the current frame. Yeah, so this is uh, what we major cons consider. Thank you. Okay, any questions? Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. Okay, good morning everyone. I'm Gautam Bhatt and I'll present our work, Atom, Accurate Tracking by Overlap Maximization. This is a joint work with Martin Danelian, Fahad Khan, and Michael Felsberg. So, do we need more accurate tracking? To find out, let's look at the results of a recent state of the art tracker, UPDT. From the videos, we can see that UPDT is fairly good at localizing the target in the image. However, the quality of the bounding boxes is poor. So in this work, our goal is to improve the accuracy in the state-of-the-art trackers. To find the reason for the poor accuracy, we look at the tracking by detection pipeline employed by many trackers, including UPDT. So given a video sequence with annotation in the first frame, these approaches learn a classifier to distinguish the target from the background regions. Next, the classifier is applied at different scales on the test frame to obtain score maps. The location and the scale which obtains the highest score gives us a new target state. As you can imagine, this strategy works fine when the target undergoes simple scaling. However, how about the cases when there are rotations or deformations? As we have seen before, the strategy struggles in this. So in order to effectively handle these kitchen scenarios, the tracker needs to have a high level knowledge of the target object. For example, it should know what constitutes an object boundary. Unfortunately, such a high-level knowledge cannot be learned from a single image. Thus, in our approach, we aim to learn a generic object representation offline, which we can then utilize for a bounding box estimation task for any arbitrary object online. Our approach is inspired from the recently introduced IOU net for object detection. So given an image with a proposal box, are you that predicts the overlap between the object and the given proposal. The key idea is that the IU prediction is differentiable with respect to the proposal coordinates. Thus, we can refine the proposal by maximizing the IUU. Compared to the naive multi-scale approach, using a class-independent IU net provides a decent improvement in tracking performance. However, in tracking, we also have the annotated target appearance from the first frame 
which we can exploit to get, to get more accurate IU predictions for the current target. We achieve this by using a modulation-based architecture. From the first frame, we compute a weight vector, which is then used to modulate the features from the test frame. Thus, we want to select the features which are most useful for the current target. Integrating the target information in this way provides a significant improvement of over 5% in tracking performance. So although the IU net can provide accurate boxes given an initial estimate, it is not trained for the task of robust target background discrimination. Thus, for this task, we employ a two-layer network head, which is trained from scratch in the first frame using the least squares laws. Now, since the classifier is trained online from scratch, the key challenge here is how to train it fast so as to get high tracking speed. For this task, we employ the conjugate gradient algorithm with Gauss-Newton approximation. Our approach provides superior convergence as well as better tracking performance compared to the standard gradient descent method. So our final tracking loop is simple. So given a test frame, we first apply the classifier to get a course estimate of the target center. Next, we generate proposals from using the estimated target center and the previous target size. The proposals are then refined by maximizing the IOU to obtain the final target box. The classifier is then updated with using this new box uh, and the new frame information. Finally, some results. On the VOT18 dataset, our approach obtains the best results outforming the recent state-of-the-art approaches. Further, our tracker runs at over 30 FPS. Good, so we have some nice numbers here, but how well does it actually track? Let's look at some qualitative examples. From these videos, we can see that our tracker tracks pretty well even on challenging scenarios. Also, you can download our code from this link and test it yourselves. Or visit us at our portion number 144 for a live demo as well as for more discussions. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Dai Kenan. I come from Dalian University of Technology and supervised by Professor Lu Huchuan. I will introduce this work. We were tracking where adaptive specially regularized correlation filters. For tracking, correlation filter is an important branch. The CF best trackers explore the large numbers of cyclical shift net samples for learning. It has been shown that special regularization can help improve the performance of CF. Usually, it is a negative Gauss shift. It has two main effects. One is to limit the shape of the filter, and another is to make the filter more focused on the learning of the target center. But this kind of predefined spatial regularization has some obvious problem. If we use the predefined regularization like negative Gauss, it will always focus on the center of the target box. That is, the part close to the center of the target box. The learning of the filter is promoted and the part further away from the center of the target box, the learning of the filter is suppressed. But in this case, figure one, occlusion, figure two, background clutter, figure three, disappearances, predefined regulation is not good and even increase the risk of filter drift. Therefore, we propose an adaptive spatial regularized correlation filter model. This is our object function. H is the filter that you need to learn. W is the adaptive spatial regularization. It is a variable and is also need to learn. Y is a Gaussian lab. X is a feature of training samples. P is a binary matrix. WR is a reference weight. Our ISRCF is a general CF model, and we, and as they well know, KCF, SRDCF, and the BACF algorithms are its special cases. For example, if W is equal to identity metric lambda R equal to lambda two equal to zero, it is BACF. 
Here is the visualization of our adaptive spatial regulation. For each pixel, a large value of the adaptive spatial regulation will give a great learning penalty of the feature of the feature at least pixel. From the first uh, sequence, we can see that uh, when there is a background clutter inside the target box, only the pixels with a clear target, the penny, the penny for the feature learning is small. And Another example is about the disappearances. When the target exists, the overall value of the spatial regularization is very small. Once the target disappears, its overall value becomes larger. When the target reappears, its value becomes to shrink again. For scale estimation, the previous CF based tracker usually applied the land filters on multi resolution of the search region to estimate scale changes. However, it is very time consuming to extract multi scale deep features. In this work, we attempt to learn two CF models. The location CF model is trained on ensemble of deep features and shallow features, use adaptive spatial regularization. And also, this ext extension process of this CF model is time consuming. It mainly requires to be extracted on one scale during the tracking process. The scale CF model is trained on the shallow features. This is our performance. On OTB 2015, our methods can achieve an IOC score of 0 0.692. This is our performance on temporal color 128. And this is the result on VOT 2016 and VOT 2017. In this table, we summarized both accuracies and speeds of top five tracks on OTB 2015. Our approach can meet real-time requirements on the GPU. Finally, you can find the code on my GitHub. If you have any other questions, you can contact me by email. Thank you. Hi, hello everyone. I'm Yao Jieliu from Michigan State University. Today I'm going to introduce our work, um, Deep Tree Learning for Zero Shot Face and Spoofing. Face recognition systems are widely used in our daily lives. Um, most of the systems take an RGB face image, match with the correct identity, and grant the access to the user's account. However, the attackers were trying to hack into the user's account by presenting the target face on materials such as digital screen. The system cannot distinguish the liveness of the input face, which can lead to a security breach. To protect the system, face anti-spoofing techniques serve the exact role by detecting the source of the face before uh, performing any recognition and matching. There are many challenges in handling face and spoofing, such as illumination, pose, and sensor variation. However, among all the challenges, unknown attacks are the hardest one, but the least to be studied. Imagine your face and spoofing system is well trained with those screen attacks, but if an attacker launches a mask attack, the system may still suffer from severe failure. We regard the detect of unknown spoof attacks as a zero-shot face anti-spoofing problem. But before we dig into any details of our methodology, let's first take a look at the data. Here we list the commonly used face anti-spoofing data sets. As we can see, none of them include more than three types of spoof attacks. Such data sets cannot provide enough diversity for a comprehensive study for this problem. Therefore, in this work, we propose a new database called SIWM that includes 13 types of spoof attacks to advance the study of this problem. Specifically, we include five types of 3D mask attacks, three makeup attacks, three partial attacks, and print replay attacks. To fully leverage this database, we adopt the leave one out testing protocols where each time you leave one spoof out as unknown and train with the rest of them. Back to the method, 
We noticed several limitations of the previous research. The first thing is the limited types as we just discussed. More importantly, those methods only model the distribution of the true phase and detect the unknown attack as anomaly. We believe if we can learn a semantic embedding from the known attack to represent the unknown, we can get a better zero-shot performance. Therefore, we propose our deep tree neural network. It consists of normal convolution layers, tree routing units, and supervision in the leaf nodes. When a data comes, the routing unit will decide a value to guide the sample to go left or go right. At the leave node, the network will perform a supervised classification task and a binary mask regression task to learn the difference between live and spoof. Showing below, the binary mask indicates a pixels that belong to the spoof material. The tree routing units are designed to find the most significant difference of the incoming data in an unsupervised fashion. We only consider the difference among the incoming spoof such that a split at each tree node will represent a spoof attribute, such as a partial attack or a global attack. In the end, we're able to learn several semantic attributes to cluster the data into subgroups for fine-grained zero-shot detection. Formally, the routing units can be described as a projection to a base vector V. Based on the eigen analysis, the larger the eigenvalue is, the more variation we can have on the base V Hence, we just need to maximize the eigenvalue to achieve our goal. In the experiment section, we evaluate our proposed method on the Livon testing protocols and compare with the state of art. Our deep tree network has a significant improvement on both average classification error rate and equal error rate. To visualize the embedding, we use the protocols where the print attack is unknown. As we can see from the testing result, our, uh, our um, printer attack can be represented by the uh, attribute from replay attack, uh, paper mask, and the funny eyeglasses. Uh, to summarize in this work, we uh, first handled the wide range zero shot face and spoofing. We proposed a novel unsupervised approach to learn the hierarchical attribute embeddings and we achieved the state of the art. Please come to the boot 146 uh, for more details. Thank you. We have some time for questions. So if you have questions, please come to the microphone. There are two microphones, one on the left-hand side, one on the right-hand side. In the meanwhile, I have a question to the last speaker. I saw your error rates, uh, ECER and EER. I find they are in double digits and pretty high, especially for the deployment. Uh, the error rates, EER and ECER. 11, 16, like you have in double digits. Yeah. It's, I believe they are pretty high and somebody would like to deploy it. It's going to be a challenge. So That's correct. So um, because the attack we are trying to um, predict is unknown, we have never seen them in the training set. Right. So for sure, they will be higher than, for example, if you see them in uh, like normal traditional and spoofing, you see them in the training set. Um, so that's the problem we're trying to attack. We're trying to see um, how much we can uh, get the emotion from the known attack. And, but um, compared with the previous method, which um, is a still that in the traditional and the spoofing, our methods have a huge improvement to detect more spoofs. Uh, okay. yeah. Thank you. If you have questions, please. Hi, I have a question for the first two uh, tracking authors. So uh, currently, the, kind of in the tracking community, people use this bounding box as a, as a localization for a target object. Um, it works, I mean, it works well for, for those rigid objects like faces, and cars, and buses. I'm wondering, uh, but for, you show examples, for, for example, the figure stating that those kind of articular objects and highly deformable objects, um, I, I think that bounding box localization may not be that uh, accurate to like localize an object. So do you think, uh, can you share your ex uh, kind of comments on how you, the method could be extended to more precise localization? Um, I guess there are, right now there are already lots of work on getting a segmentation mask out as well instead of just a bounding box. And yeah, I guess even from here you can get like some coarse attention map so that uh, which you can use as an auxiliary information for obtaining the bounding box. So I think, yeah, that's 
there are more and more works which provide a segmentation no? segmentation mask. Okay, thank you. You have one last question. I have a question for the second talk. Um, how do the adaptive filters respond to noise? We we use uh, we we op the optimize the, the correlation filters and the special 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 regulation at the same time. The special regulation can learn the can learn the the part if it can can distinguish distinguish the part it is not target or not. If it, it is target, its planet is very low. If it's, it's noise, it's, it's planet, planet is very high. So okay, this will end the QA session. So let us thank our speaker once again. Hello everyone, my name is Jian Kangdeng from Imperial College London. ACFACE is a joint work with Jia Guo, Nian Nan Xue, and uh, Stephen Zabilu. The main target of uh, face feature embedding, so the motivation of deep face recognition are intra-class companions, and uh, uh, the, the <laughs> targets of face recognition is intra-class companions and inter-class discrepancy. Triple loss uh, has, has uh, uh, the margin, but uh, image to image uh, comparison is uh, uh, difficult as the image numbers are very large. We change image to image comparison into image to class comparison as the class number is much fewer. Uh, in softmax loss, image to class comparison is very efficient, but there is no concept of margin. So we know that uh, extensive comparison and uh, uh, margin are very useful for deep face recognition. Based off on those observations, we propose the arc face, which has extensive image to class comparison as well as the margin. So there are two main steps. The first step uh, is X and W normalization, which turn the uh, similarity score into cosine similarity. The second step is, is incorporating active angular margin. ArcFace is very easy, only needs several lines of code. ArcFace is explicable. Uh, from the view of softmax loss, ArcFace can enhance the DC margin. Uh, the angular margin is uh, exactly corresponding into arc and geodesic distance. From the view of triple loss, ArcFace change image to image comparison into efficient image to class comparison. Uh, compared to surface phase and the cosine phase, arc phase has a different descent margin and a different uh, tactological curves. Those difference uh, improves the uh, performance, obviously. Arc phase is very efficient, even though the W is very large, but we can easily split it into uh, different uh, graphic cards. Arc phase is effective. We obtain state of art performance on many benchmarks. Uh, ArcFace is also enlightening. It can be followed, extended, and improved, and can be employed in some related research. Uh, we uh, release everything to facilitate the research. Now I show a video demo which talks on searching six challenge case. ArcFace is still has space to improve. Here are some uh, uh, embedding results, searching results. As we can see, ArcFace can handle uh, intro variance by, uh, to some extent, but uh, for some extremely challenging case, ArcFace is still uh, can be improved. Uh, beyond ArcFace, we organize a lightweight uh, face recognition challenge and uh, welcome participation and uh, paper submission. That's all. Thank you. Okay, my name is Lin Ma. My presentation is entitled as Learning Joint Gate Representation via Triplet Loss Minimization. 
Gate recognition is the task of identifying people at a distance using videos of their working patterns. This is an active research topic in the field of computer vision due to its importance in real-world applications, such as the video surveillance, forensic identification, evidence collection. As a behavioral biometric, gate exhibits unique advantages of the other biometric like fingerprints, iris, and face. Because gate-based methods can identify subjects from low-resolution video sequences with no subjects' cooperations. Most of the previous works focus on cross-gate representations, which is a concatenation of a pair of gate images and labeled to same or different as the input of the figure. While being effective in capturing the relationship between a pair of gates, these methods ignore the labels of each single gate images. Nowadays, some deep learning methods tackle the problem based on single gate representation solely. They extract a unique gate feature enclosed in a single image and then match them to predict the relationship, while this method ignores the cross-gate representations. In this paper, we develop a deep network to jointly learn the unique gate and cross-gate representations. And also, we propose an effective loss functions for gate recognition, which is to guide our model to extract powerful features with smaller intra-class variations and large inter-class differences. As the figure shows, from A to B, the proposed model additionally learns the identical unique gate representation, which enlarges interclass differences among subjects. From B to C, with the help of the proposed quintuplet loss, not only the interclass variance increases, but also the intraclass discrepancy is decreased. This is our basic framework, which is named as GUCNet, Joint Unique and Cross Gate Net. The input is a pair of gates. There are three output branches, two corresponding to unique gate representation and one for cross gate representation. The proposed GOC net is updated based on two kinds of the representations. And the overall loss function is a combination of the two kinds of losses, the unique, unique loss and cross gate loss, which is shown in these slides. The popular methods of learning the cross-gate representation are based on recognition signal, which aim to classify concatenate cross-gate representation. In order to obtain more powerful cross-gate representation, we adopt both recognition and verification signals as our supervision signal to and propose a quintuplet loss. Different from traditional recognition, Verification loss, we define a novel quintuplet loss based on the two uh, quintuplet gates. And the slide shows the top volume is the previous loss, and the bottom is the our proposed loss. And based on the loss function, we extend the basic GOC net to multi parity GOC net, which serves as a final framework during training. As a figure shows, a pair of gates can be combined as a whole, while the label of the same ID and different ID. Three pairs of gates are input to extract features. Two pairs of gates are from different subjects, while one pair of gates is from an identical subject. We test them on three public data sets. And the rank of one accuracy by varying the weight parameters on the validation set is shown in this slide. Based on the figures, we set different hyperparameters in our final training strategy. In order to show the effectiveness of GOCNet and the quintuplet loss function, we reported the results of different rank accuracies of three, six models on two data sets. These tables show that the GOCNet and the loss are performing the conventional same models. Then we compare our methods with the other several arts methods. The results in table three show our methods can outperform the several arts methods on both data sets. Also, the, cross, the issue of a cross view is crucial for gate recognition. Thus, we evaluate our methods under the condition of a cross view. The comparison is indicates that our proposal achieves satisf satisfactory performance under the cross view protocol. And thanks. If you have any question, please drop by our poster. Hello, everyone. My name is Yuan Zhang from Michigan State University. Today, I'm going to present a work on 
gate recognition via disentangled repetition learning. So what is gate recognition? Here are some examples shown here. It aims to identify individuals by the way they walk under different variations like uh, changing clothes, carrying bag, or different view angle. There are mainly two types of gate representations, so appearance-based and model-based. For example, GEI is appearance-based. It's used average syllables as final representation, and 2D post estimation is an example of model-based. Then both can be sent to classifier to perform the recognition. Um, but the thing is, uh, there are some issues with those methods. First, we see a huge difference of a two GEI if the same person in different clothes. And the second issue is that uh, the model-based methods are very easy to fail when the person is a long distance from the re recording camera. And thirdly, the front of view has much less information than the side view in both representations here. <coughs> then let me introduce our work, GayNet. First, we detect and examine the people from original video. Then GayNet extracts two disentanglement representations, the appearance and gait, which has been used to perform the recognition. Here's more details. Uh, first, we get appearance and gait features from frame IT1 through the encoder. We do the same thing for another frame IT2. Um, so appearance of IT1 and gait of IT2 can be sent to, into the decoder to obtain a synthesized frame we should be very similar to IT2. We encourage their similarity using a reconstruction loss, the purpose to disentangle the appearance gate for each of the frame. And uh, the same encoder process another video of the same subject, but in different variation. We define gate similarity loss, which is a mean square loss on average two set of gate features. This loss encourages the same subject has the same gate information even different uh, variation. And then we send the gate features to LSTM, and then output the corresponding hidden variables. Then we incrementally calculate the cross entropy loss between the average hidden variable and ground truth. For example, here we calculate the loss on average of two features, three features, until all of them. Then finally, we jointly minimize all the three loss functions with gradient descent method. We evaluate on three the most popular gate database, KSLB, OUSR, and USF. They all have large amount of su subjects under different working variations like a view angle, carrying bags, and changing their clothes. And uh, to encourage more research on the gate recognition from frontal view, we collect a HD frontal view gate database under six variations, including view angle, time, and this walking speed, and uh, carrying bag, 